I want to speak today on the topic of hosting the Holy Spirit. I want you to open the Bible with me to Gospel of Luke chapter 19. Now he sought to see who Jesus was. This is speaking about Zacchaeus. But could not because of the crowd. For he was of a short stature. I'm going to pause there for a second. Before we talk about the Holy Spirit, I want to start from, this, from the beginning about the, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Before we host the Holy Spirit, we have to experience the gospel. But before we experience the gospel, we have to experience our depravity. And I'm going to use the story of Zacchaeus to paint three simple steps or three simple points. I would encourage you to take notes if you're a... Um, Believe in no taking for those of you whose attention span is sort of like a goldfish where you lose me after 15 seconds. I ask you to just kind of help yourself a little bit, pinch yourself maybe a little bit, because some things I'm going to share are going to be a little bit more deeper than maybe you are usually used to at the conference. I want to paint also and lay a foundation of what it means to be a Christian and what we believe as Christians concerning the gospel and concerning the Holy Spirit. The first thing I wanted to mention is about Zacchaeus is Zacchaeus was short. Now, one thing I know about short people, they're born this way. And you know the second thing? There's nothing they can do to change. Stretches, pull-ups, uh, broccoli, vitamins, um, none of that helps. High heels, you're still short. <laughs> Wearing all kinds of uh, lifters, you're still short. It, Zacchaeus was short. And the Bible says because he was short, he could not see Jesus. Zacchaeus is not the only one who was born short. You were born short too. The Bible says we fell short of the glory of God. This doesn't mean that we don't try to see Jesus. The Bible says Zacchaeus tried to see Jesus, but the problem wasn't that he didn't try hard enough. The problem was not just with his behavior. The problem was with his birth. He was born this way. He was born short. The scripture says that all of us are born short, and because of that, we are not able to see God. Now we can get, and I'll get a glimpse of God. We can do a little jump once in a while, do a good work, do something and get a glimpse of the goodness of God. But we can't see Him. We can't be with Him. It's not because we're not trying or because we have bad intentions. It's because we have a bad nature and we are born short. And everything we try to do, we cannot change about that. The Bible says that he couldn't see Jesus and he uses this phrase, because of the crowd. I find it interesting that though he was short and couldn't change that, the crowd, who was the crowd? They were those who were the closest to Jesus got the blame for why he couldn't see Jesus. It still happens today. When people are not born again, guess who they blame why they're not born again? The church people. It's those close to Jesus why I'm not a Christian. Do you know why I'm not a Christian? I've met Christians. No, the reason why you're not a Christian is because you're a born sinner. And because you cannot see God, you will always seek to blame anybody close to God who's hindering your view. But your problem is not people close to Jesus. Your problem is your shortness. I don't believe in God anymore. Why? Because I met Christians. I have seen the church politics and now I have been this discouraged and I left the church, people would say. The real reason, the real reason you left the church is because you're short. Not because those people are hindering that. Should Christians improve and become nicer? Yes, but that does not change the fact the unconverted, not born again people will still have an excuse for why they're not born again. If you are in this room today and you are in that crowd, you're close to Jesus, you are in the circle, my question today for you is not, are you in church, but are you in Christ? Because Zacchaeus didn't settle to be in the crowd. Zacchaeus started to look for a solution so he can clearly see the Lord. 
A few years ago, I was in the Denver airport, and me and Denver airports have very bad history. We, we do not have a good relationship. Even what happened yesterday, I spent all night in the a, in a, in a Denver airport because of the stuff that happened there. But a few years ago, I was on my way to some international flight, and me and my wife were in Denver airport, and we went out and found some little coffee shop and started uh, drinking coffee and kind of didn't pay attention to time. And next thing that happened is we decided it's probably time to leave our coffee shop and go uh, to our gate because we were flying to Germany. As we were walking, enjoying our walk, we're walking into our gate. And it's like that movie scene from a Left Behind movie where the gate is closed, everybody's gone. It's our gate to Germany and our plane is slowly moving away from the gate. It's our plane. We have the ticket to be there. We're supposed to be there. We planned our whole trip this whole week to be on this plane and it's just drifting and it's like slow-mo. Of course, we came to the door like those five foolish virgins <laughs> hitting a, open, open, we're here. We didn't mean to be late. Everything is okay. Could you just get us in? And the plane just left. We were this close. We were in the airport and missed the airplane. Church is the airport. It's supposed to introduce you to the airplane. But it's possible to be in the airport and miss the airplane. It's possible to have your grandma a prophet and you miss God. Oh, that's not possible. Judas was in the airport, missed the airplane. It's possible to be in the church because you grew up there. But my question today, are you in Christ? Are you born again? Have you repented of your sin? Are you living your life as a person who simply have jumps? Once in a while you have these experiences, but your life is not surrendered to Jesus and you are not born again. My message to you tonight is that tonight is the night where Jesus does not want you to have any more jumps to Him. He wants you to have a relationship with Him based on your repentance, based on your faith, and for you to be born again. Having a great grandfather who served Jesus is not enough to go to heaven because God does not have grandchildren. God has children. Having a mom or dad that loved Jesus is a good start, but you have to have your own relationship with God. And tonight is that night. Today, this conference is that conference where their faith has to become your faith. Can somebody say amen? amen. Zacchaeus was born short. He tried to see Jesus. This is an example of humanity who doesn't know God. This is an example of humanity who is good in their own eyes, but not good enough in the eyes of God. This is an example of all of us who are born short, who try to improve by doing all these religious gymnastics. If I do enough good works, I will please God. Instead of realizing we're sinners, we need, we need to repent. We need to place our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We need to be born again and we need to begin new life. We don't need to be good. We need to be new. We need to be alive for the glory of God. Now the Bible says Zacchaeus was born short, wanted to see Jesus, couldn't see Jesus. I want you to read the next verse. If you read with me to verse number four. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. Verse five. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay in your house. So Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but he's too short. He cannot see him. He didn't jump up and down trying to get a glimpse. He didn't settle to join the crowd. At least I'm in the crowd that's close to Jesus. That's people who say, I don't need to be born again. I'll just join the Christians. No, 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 no. None of us are going to heaven because you were around Christians. We're going to heaven because we were in Christ. Zacchaeus, secondly, what he does is Zacchaeus runs up and the Bible says he climbs up a sycamore tree. But I want you to notice the Bible does not say Zacchaeus saw Jesus. It says Jesus saw Zacchaeus. The second thing is that God provided us a tree 2,000 years ago 
that every short person can climb on and instead of us trying to see God, this is where God sees us and has relationship with us through the blood of His Son. And it's called the cross. It's called the gospel. Now why is the gospel very important? We must understand is that we are not Christians and believers because we try to do good. We believe in good. We are Christians and believers because Jesus died on the cross and paid a penalty for our sin. It was necessary. So many young people do not understand why the cross was a necessity. We have a holy God and we have a loving God. And we are sinners. God's holiness demands that every sin gets punished. God's love provided the payment for our sin by letting His Son die on the cross so that God can remain holy and loving at the same time. On the cross, God's holiness and God's love intersected. God gave Jesus what you deserve so that you can receive what Jesus deserved. God couldn't take your sin, your ungodliness and just put it under the carpet and hit clear button without somebody paying for it. That would make Him corrupt and God doesn't become corrupt for no one. A tribe leader established a tribe and decided to create an order in his tribe by making 100 rules. And the punishment for breaking any of the rules was 100 lashes. It was to bring order in his tribe. Rules were simple. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't do bad stuff, the normal stuff. A few days later passes by and they realize that one of the children broke one of the rules. Lo and behold, they find out that one of the children that broke the rules was actually the tribe leader's son. So the whole tribe gathered together to see what will the tribe leader do. Will he now punish his own son with 100 lashes or will he say, hey guys, um, can we make an amendment to the rules because I didn't realize the children will break them. So could we just change the whole structure now? We're not going to abuse children. That's just not right. So they gather together and the tribe leader gets up and says, we're not making any amendments. We are going to have to punish the person that broke these rules with a hundred lashes. Everybody looks at him and they say, what an abusive father. How could he do that to his own kid? So they tie his son to a post and get ready to give him 100 lashes. Right before they do that, the tribe leader comes, takes his shirt off, surrounds his son, and turns to the person saying, now you can begin. In this way, he protected the law and saved his son. If you don't understand the gospel, you will never have appreciation for what happened 2,000 years ago and why Christians believe in the man, Jesus Christ, and why it was necessary for Jesus to die. God couldn't save you. God couldn't forgive your sin without that sin being paid for. That sin had to be paid for by Jesus' blood. This is why the cross is necessary. Because through the cross, God can forgive you without being unholy. That's why when I have Muslim friends or people who will say, you know, Allah will save me and I will go to heaven after I die, I say absolutely not. If Allah is true like you say and He is a just God, you're going to hell because He will judge you for your sin. Oh, but Allah will forgive me. If He forgives you, He's a corrupt judge. If He's a corrupt judge, He's not God. He's a figment of your imagination. Only you come up with a God like that, who forgives and not forgives, who can misuse justice and not justice. If that is the judge in my town, he's corrupt judge. He's not a real God. He's a made up figment of your imagination. Our God, we didn't make him because we couldn't come up with God dying on the cross if we wanted to. That is not a hero story of God coming, taking a human flesh and being dead like a criminal and suffering. But see, it was our God who said, I am holy and I am righteous and I will judge every sin. But I love those sinners, so I will let my son take the penalty of your sin, die like a murderer, die like a criminal on that cross so that I can be righteous for giving you a sinner. <laughs> 
Some people think when we die, we will go to heaven and God will have a justice scale. On one side, he will have all our good works. On the other side, he will have all our bad works. And if we do more good than bad, we will go to heaven. If you believe in that in your subconscious, you believe in paganism, not the gospel. Go to court when you get a ticket next time or some kind of a fine and tell the judge this theory. Judge, I've been driving for 12 months on one side of the scale and then on the other scale, I drove really bad for 12 seconds. Judge, let's do the math. 12 seconds is less than 12 months. So am I free to go? Judge will ask you, what drugs are you been taking? He say, are you, are you okay? Justice doesn't work with good versus bad. It's always good and bad versus justice. And we always lose. That's why when we die, God's not going to put our good versus bad. We are placed in Jesus. So God steps on one scale. God's perfection and God's justice steps on one scale. Jesus steps on the other scale and I step into Jesus. And that's how I'm going to heaven because I am in Christ. Not just because I am in the church, but because I am in Jesus. And therefore my sins are forgiven. And therefore when I climb on that cross, when I climb on that sycamore tree, God looks at me. Why? Because God can be holy. God can be forgiving without being unholy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The cross met God's demand for punishment of my sin. And you may say, I do not like an angry God. Trust me, you would never want a judge who is not just when you're the victim. The only time we want a judge who's corrupt is when we're the perpetrator. And God does not change. God is just and is holy. And justice and holiness of God demands punishment for sin. His anger is righteous. His anger is not his blowing up steam, running with vengeance. God's anger is just and is holy. But God let his son absorb all of that. Why? So that he can be forgiving toward me the criminal, me the sinner, without being unholy. Amen. Billy Graham one time had a speeding ticket and the reason why I'm taking just a little bit longer to explain that because I want every young person, the teenager and the youth to have a comprehension of the gospel of why we believe what we believe before I just go into the Holy Spirit in just a second. Billy Graham gets a ticket, ends up in front of a judge. Now the judge recognized him and of course he was very happy uh, to see Billy Graham and also was very unhappy to see Billy Graham. <laughs> Because Billy Graham should have not been speeding. And the judge, you know, hits his little hammer, bang, and says, uh, you have to pay a, pay a full fine. It was a little bit disappointing. Judge takes off the robe, puts it aside, pulls out his checkbook, comes down and signs a check for exactly the same amount he just ordered Billy to pay. And gave it to Billy and he said, I have to remain a just judge, but I'm also your friend. God hit the hammer 2,000 years ago and he said every sin will be punished but God also came down from heaven took on the human form without denying his divinity and paid our check and paid our bill therefore he could be loving and holy at the same time no religion has that why because every religion is men coming up with stuff Christianity is God coming up with men. He made us and revealed himself to us. I don't want a God who is not holy. I won't bow my knee to God who is not just. But the God we serve is not just holy and just, but merciful, compassionate and loving. Not one reference to Allah in Quran about him being loving and graceful. But my Bible, your Bible makes you to understand for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. On the cross, 
two things happened. The two main things happened. Number one, on the cross, Jesus died as a substitution for us. Somebody say substitution. Number two, Jesus, we were included in his death. Somebody say included. Somebody say substitution and inclusive. Why is that? Because we have a dual problem. Our problem is sins and our problem is sin. Somebody say sin and somebody say sins. Let me explain. Sin is a nature, a principle. It's something within us that we're born with that does sins. Think of a spider and a spider web. Sins, the things we do are the spider web. Spider is the one that makes the web. The sin nature, that thing in us that wants to do bad. The Bible calls it the old man wants to do bad. So what God does on the cross is the blood of Jesus cleanses our sins. But on the cross, God takes my sin and nails it together with his son, Jesus Christ. He kills the spider and cleans the web. What I've always heard about the gospel is this. On the cross, the blood was spilled. But I don't remember hearing that on the cross, I was killed. God didn't just cleanse my sins on the cross. God nailed the sinner with his son. When I was younger, I looked forward to a day when I will die so that I no longer struggle with the old nature. But Paul in Romans chapter 6 keeps talking about the day he died and took my old nature. So I don't have to look forward to my funeral. I can look forward to his funeral and to understand God did not just clear the web. God nailed the spider. He took the old me and together with his son nailed that me on the Calvary. Look what Romans says, chapter 6. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Verse 8, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 11, reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, and so forth and so on. Interesting, we have two sacraments as Protestants that we celebrate, the Holy Communion and the water baptism. The Holy Communion reminds us the blood was spilled. Water baptism identifies us that our old man was buried. The blood does three things. The first thing is it satisfies the wrath of God. The blood clears your record with God. God who was counting your sins hits the clear button because the blood cleared it. The second thing that the blood does is it sprinkles your conscience because just because God is good with you, sometimes you're not good with you. You're forgiven by God, but you're not at peace with yourself. The memories of the past, how what you did, how you did it, is so bringing guilt and shame. And the Bible says that we've been sprinkled in our conscience by the blood of Jesus Christ. Meaning the blood doesn't just fix my relationship with God. The blood fixes my relationship with me. But just about the time I learned how to apply the blood and thank God for the blood, the devil comes along and tries to remind me of everything that I've done. And in Revelation it says the blood is also powerful to silence the voice of the accuser. So the blood clears my record, the blood cleanses my conscience, and the blood conquers the accusing voice of the devil. 
One time the devil came to Martin Luther and said, you know, look at all the sins that you committed. You, can, you claim to be a reformer. Look, you're just a sinner. And Martin Luther told the devil, he said, devil, you missed a few sins. There's some room over there. Add some more. And when you finish it, take a red ink and mark from the one corner to the other one. And then from one corner to the other one, the paid in full and devil, get out of my house. The blood. Somebody say the blood did not lose its power. There is power in the blood. There is power in the blood of Jesus Christ. There is power to forgive you. There is power to break your bondage. And there is power to silence every voice of shame. And there is power to silence every voice of guilt in your life. I'm not talking about mental gymnastics. I'm not talking about positive thinking. I'm talking about precious, pure, powerful blood of the Lamb. His rope is dipped in blood. My Savior has blood that, and that blood cleanses me. That blood purifies me. That blood restores me. But you know what the blood does not do? It doesn't touch the old man. It touches my sins. It doesn't touch my sin nature. The blood does not kill the old man. The cross does that. The blood cleanses me, clears the record, conquers the voice of the accuser. But how many of you know, you pray the prayer, you repent it, you go back home and you do exactly the same. And you're like, and I'm tired of that. When will God deliver me? And then you watch a video on YouTube where somebody says, your problem is the devil. You're like, oh yeah, that's what I need. I need deliverance from demons. I want you to notice in Romans chapter 6, Paul does not say about deliverance of demons. He's talking about deliverance from sin. And he said that deliverance, you know where it happened? It doesn't happen when you get delivered from demons. Deliverance from the old man happened on the cross 2,000 years ago. And then Paul goes a step further. He says, you know this ritual and this sacrament that we do as Christians is actually us identifying with our funeral that happened 2,000 years ago. When we go into water, Paul is saying, you are identifying with Jesus' cross. You're going out of the water. You're identifying with his life. The blood was for me. I was included in the cross. The blood took care of my sins, but the cross killed the sinner, which is me. The blood cleansed the web, but the cross, Apostle Paul says, it dealt with the spider. We live in a generation today when people identify with anything. People identify to be cats. Men identify to be women. Crazy stuff. People identify with things that are not factual. But the Bible says you identify with Jesus. And that is not a figment of imagination. That is simply a factual historic fact. Jesus died. He was buried. That's why when you get baptized, you don't get sprinkled. You get immersed. Why? Because you're identifying with your funeral, which happened. You died. You died. And I know some of you say, well, Vlad, that's really cool. I don't feel dead. <laughs> I am not. Let me ask you a question. What's more powerful, your feelings or the truth? Secondly, let me ask you a question. Why does Paul in Romans chapter 6 keep saying this? Knowing this, knowing this, knowing this, which means most of us only know about the blood nobody or we have not been enlightened about the power of his death and when we get baptized some of us are more focused about making sure that we become members of the church so we can marry instead of realizing that now I identified and I died with him I don't get baptized to be wet I get baptized to remind myself I died that means that I kill the deeds of the flesh. I fight against the cravings of the flesh from the position that I died with Him. Galatians 2.20, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I. Meaning my old man is no longer alive. It's been nailed on the cross. That's so powerful because you no longer have to wait until you die to be free from porn. 
you look back to the cross. There is power in the cross of Jesus Christ to set you free from what's enslaving you today. I believe in the ministry of deliverance. I believe in counseling. I believe in therapy. I believe in discipline. But nothing, nothing is more powerful than the power of the blood and the power of the cross. Satan doesn't fear my discipline. He fears the cross. Demons that don't tremble before my efforts, they tremble before the cross. Because only the cross took old me and nailed it right with Jesus. God didn't just let Jesus die for you. He let Jesus, you died with him as well. So it's not only the sins, but also the sin that's dead. You may say, well, Vlad, that's good, but I don't feel that. That's why Romans 6 says, knowing this, reckon yourself, meaning consider yourself, present your members as instruments. And then chapter 8, he begins to talk about the Holy Spirit. Let's review. We're not good enough in ourselves. We're too short. We're born short. We need the cross because God is holy. He judges sin. The cross of Jesus Christ has two sides to it. The blood cleanses us and the cross, God kills the sinner. God takes the sin and nails it. This doesn't mean that the battle is over, but it means that we have a fighting chance and we're fighting from the place of, I've been crucified with Christ, now I can put to death the deeds of the body. Does it mean that sometimes we have demonic oppressions? 100%. Does it mean we still have to apply discipline? 100%. But we don't operate from the place of trying to kill it. We're operating from the place Jesus nailed it. I exalt the cross, not myself. Power is in Him, not in me. The pressure is off of my shoulders because He carried the pressure of my old man and nailed it on the cross. And I look to his death, not to my funeral, to be liberated from every lust, every pride, and everything that enslaves me. Zacchaeus. Jesus says, Zacchaeus. Hi, Jesus. And then Jesus says this. We're going to your house. The third thing, which makes all the difference. Because you may know I'm not good enough in myself. I need to get saved. The power of the cross, the power of the blood. But the real change in Zacchaeus' life happened when Jesus came to his house. Somebody say, host the Holy Spirit. I love what Jesus said to Zacchaeus. He said, Zacchaeus, make haste. Today, I must be in your house. And they go to his house. And Zacchaeus, I want you to notice, wasn't focused at first in trying to change. He was a rich man. And I find it interesting that Jesus walking into Zacchaeus' house does not even correct Zacchaeus, even though we as Christians need to be corrected. The Word of God is for correction, reproof, doctrine, instruction, and righteousness. We need to be rebuked. We need to be corrected. We need leaders to tell the truth. But in Zacchaeus' case, it's almost like Jesus is showing the contrast because the chapter before this chapter with Zacchaeus, Jesus tells a rich ruler, says, you need to sell everything. And he's so sad and does not sell anything and walks away. But in this scripture, a rich man who's a liar, who cheats, who cuts corners, brings Jesus into his house. And Jesus, we don't see saying anything. And the rich man starts giving half of his income. He says, Whatever I, whoever I duped, I'm going to pay him four times more. You're seeing a shift begins to take place in the core of his being. Because God didn't really change your heart if your wallet wasn't converted. When it touches your wallet, that's when Jesus says, Now salvation has come to this man's house. Because you can say all you want, I surrender all. But if you're still fighting about this mammon God and holding on to possessions and that is not surrender, my friend, eh, talk is cheap. But Zacchaeus' heart gets changed. He doesn't give 10%. Most people say, we shouldn't be giving 10%. Zacchaeus like passed that test long time ago, 50%. Give four times more everybody he duped, everybody he lied about, what he sold to. Call them back and says, four times more, I will bless you. And he hasn't taken a class on financial responsibility, integrity, and purity. This is just one second of hosting Jesus. See, the cross is where you meet him. Home 
is where he changes you. Many people leave Jesus where they meet him. Right here. He calls you by your name. Your sins get forgiven. You feel the peace, the weight is lifted off of your shoulders. Some of us get filled with the Holy Ghost and we speak in other tongues. Others of us experience the healing of a broken heart. Oh, so good. I love altars. But the real change is when you take the Jesus you meet at the altar back to your home. And today that Jesus, he says, another I will send in my name. His name is the Holy Spirit. You take him home with you. Something begins to happen. Your heart begins to change. At first, there is a conflict. At first, your sensitive conscience becomes to pickle you, begins to hurt you because you come home and you realize Holy Spirit is not pleased with my playlist. Holy Spirit is not pleased with my subscriptions. Holy Spirit is not pleased and at first it will be difficult but please understand it is necessary process if you want to be changed in your life is to host the Holy Spirit in your life. That's where the real shift and the change exists. I read this book by R.T. Kendall in the Pigeon Religion. He talks about Holy Spirit and he said a British couple, Sandy and Bernice, accepted a call from their denomination to be missionaries in Israel. A house was provided for them near Jerusalem. After they moved into their new home, they noticed a dove had come to live in their house. They were honored to be living near Jerusalem and were particularly thrilled to have the dove come and live there. They considered it to be something of a seal of approval from God. They were doing God's will to have a dove. Though the husband noticed an unsettling pattern in the dove's behavior. Every time the door was slammed or if there was a lot of noise in the house, if they raised their voices, the dove would be disturbed and flutter off. Sometimes not returning for some time. This worried the husband. He felt they were in danger of fr frightening the dove off permanently. With this in mind, he brought us to his wife. And he said, have you noticed that every time there's a lot of noise, if we slam the door, the dove flies away. And she says, yes, it makes me feel sad. I'm afraid that the dove will fly away and never come back. And I want you to listen to what the husband said. He said, either the dove will adjust his behavior to us, or if we really wanna make sure we don't lose him, we must adjust our behavior to the dove. If I can ask just for a little bit more lights in the room right now, I'm going to demonstrate something. If I can have two young men, just the two young men, just come up quickly. Okay. One cup is full. One cup is empty. This is going to be the challenge. I want you to go all the way to that door right here as fast as you can and then come back without spilling. And if we can clear the path, one, two, three. Without spilling. Come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. The one without water, come on. You can do a little bit better than that. Okay. It's, it's okay. The goal is not to spill. I want you to notice what happened. He never looked at the cup. He never looked at you. He was fast. He was full. Have you noticed I didn't ask him to run slower and be careful? I simply gave him something that was full and it affected his speed. It affected what he focused on. It changed everything about what he did. Because the goal was no longer, how fast can I run? It's how do I walk that I don't spill? That's why God didn't just give us a set of rules. He filled us with the person of the Holy Spirit. So if you host the Holy Spirit, you're focused on Him, it changes your behavior.
It changes how you talk. It changes what you do, what you don't do, who you hang out with, who you don't hang out with. Because the moment you notice there is a spill and you feel it, lack of peace. It's not that you lost salvation, but you're losing intimacy. The moment you notice other people can argue, other people can do that. But the problem with other people is they may have a cup. You have water. See, when Zacchaeus got Jesus, he got water. Everything has to change. Why? Because I'm hosting someone special. Your relationship with the Holy Spirit has the power to change how you talk, how you live. Because the moment you begin to get to know him, you begin to get to know he is grieved. And you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. And when you notice that you do a few things, a few things spill and you say, I am so sorry, Lord, that was not right. And it's not about legalism, it's about intimacy now. And it's no longer about what can I justify, it's about how can I stay close to the Holy Spirit. While my friends ask, how close to hell can I get without going there? I say, how close to the Holy Spirit I can stay so I can be filled with the precious Holy Ghost. Every man, every, wo every woman, let me ask you a question. How is your speed of life? How is your focus? What are you focused on? When somebody comes in to me and always complains about what everybody's in church is doing, that to me is one of the first signs the cup is empty. I'm not saying the church is perfect. No, it's not. But I also know full people focus on different things than those who aren't. Host the Holy Spirit. Live in such a way where the heavenly dove is not grieved. And when he is grieved, do whatever you need to do to get it back. I'm not saying that we lose the Holy Spirit, but I'm saying we lose the sweetness. When we begin to ignore him, it doesn't leave us, but he withdraws. And one of the signs begin to happen that he withdrew is when there is no carefulness, no caution, no fear of God. And you're running. And you're fast. Distracted. And you don't even feel anything. Numb. Because nothing is there anymore. My goal isn't to condemn anybody. But to let you know, have you left the Holy Spirit where you met Him? Or did you take Him home with you? Have you adjusted your life for the dove? Or are you hoping for the dove to adjust to you and He quietly withdrew? He's very sensitive, but He's also very patient. Holy Spirit knows your proclivities. He knows how inconsistent you are. He knows your struggles. That's why He helps us with our weaknesses. When He signed up to go with us, He knew all we're capable of doing. He still came. All He's waiting is for us to acknowledge our wrongs and focus on keeping that closeness with Him more than running fast impressive to other people. That's why Paul says, live your life worthy of the call of God, fully pleasing the Lord. Fully pleasing. This means I want to live my life where I don't leak the Holy Spirit, but I'm full and overflowing. Host the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying not to work on your issues. Do work on your issues. But have you noticed, I didn't instruct them to run carefully. Because his cup was full, his speed changed. Have you noticed when you wash your car and it's raining, you avoid puddles? But when your car is dirty, you don't miss them? Why? Something about being unclean that attracts, desires, more unclean. 
something about clean the desires to be more clean more pure more holy I'm not saying to clean a dirty window with a dirty rag come to the cross there is power in the blood if you lived in, in a way that maybe was secret sin compromising you lost that precious touch with the Holy Spirit today God marked this night because the Holy Spirit yearns jealously for you he loves you he misses that connection but for some of us he's deeply grieved you can come back you can pray the prayer create within me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me oh God come back to him surrender to him give yourself up to him some of you, you're, you're struggling with habits maybe and patterns. You're like, I want to break that away. What we must understand is we need to go to the cross. We need to start with the gospel. We can't start with our strength. We got to start with the power of the blood and the power of the gospel. But then we got to host the Holy Spirit. Take Holy Spirit home. Bring Him into your life. Live your life as though Holy Spirit is watching because He is. What happens when you're driving and you notice a police officer? Slow down. Heart beats faster. Godliness goes up. Most of you start speaking in tongues. <laughs> and a lot of you start repenting and say, Lord, whatever I've done, intentionally, unintentionally, while we're here right now, forgive your servant. And I right away promise you will increase my tithe next Sunday if I don't get pulled over. <laughs> Interesting how quickly the awareness of an officer changes how you drive. Holy Spirit is not a cop that wants to always pull you over. But He is God. When you live with the awareness of His presence, you drive differently. I mean you live differently. You speak differently. It's like carrying a cup. There's a conscious, you're, you're conscious. This can hurt this precious person. I don't want to do that. The way I talk to my wife can hurt this person. The way I present myself in front of these people can hurt this person. What I go WW on or if I log in into an app, this can hurt this person. And I want to live my life where the Holy Spirit is ungrieved, but hosted, honored. You're either hosting the Spirit or hiding sin. You're either living in secret place or in secret sin. But everybody here has a secret. And the question is not whether you have a secret. The question is what kind of secret? Is this the Holy Spirit? Or is this something else that if that were to come up publicly, it will create a scandal and embarrass you. Today, I don't want you to just clear your private life. Replace it with what's holy, precious, godly. That you walk in the fear of God in the awareness of this person who lives in you, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I invite people concerning the relationship with the Holy Spirit, I want to ask if there is anybody in this room, every eye opened, every head up. If you don't know where you will spend eternity, if Jesus were to come today, and I'm not trying to cause people to doubt their salvation, I want people to examine their faith. If you are not born again, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're hiding in the airport, but you're not in the airplane. Your parents may be a Christian, or perhaps you came here because a girl invited you, or you knew that there were some other people, and you're just going to have a really good time. And I hope you really had a good time. But it will grieve my heart and the heart of everyone here, if you were here and we don't see you in heaven. So I'm going to ask you right now, I'm not going to make an emotional appeal. If you're not right with God, if you're not where you're supposed to be, I'm going to ask you to quickly step out of your seat 
and you want to be saved to come out of your seat and come and stand right here in the front and you're saying today I want to give my life to Jesus Christ maybe you have backslid you had a relationship with God and stuff happened. You're blaming it on church. You're blaming it maybe on other people or perhaps it was your own sin, demons, what, whatever the reason is. But you're not. You walked away from your relationship with Christ. Today's the time to come back. I want you to quickly come out of your seat and come and stand here in the front right now. I'm not going to make that very long. So if the Lord is probing and a lot of times you know heart is beating three times faster, maybe Jesus is knocking. You just make your way forward. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks about you. You might be even a leader here. It doesn't matter to me. If you don't know where you will spend eternity and you're not born again, right now is the time. Right now is the time. No need for clap. No need. It's, it's okay. Just come. Just pray. The rest of you just pray. Just pray. Don't look at the front. Just pray. Pray. Close your eyes and pray. Just pray. If I can ask the worship team to come up. If you're not right with God, if today you want to make your faith, this your parents' faith, your faith. I want you to come forward. Kneel your knee before Jesus, the Son of God. Ask for His blood to wash you. Give Him your life. I'm not talking about your sin, your life. He doesn't just want your sin. He wants you. He wants all of you. He didn't give His life. To get the trash can of you. He gave his life to get all of you. Give completely all of you to him. You will experience freedom from the power of sin. Freedom from the grip of sin. Because of his cross and because of his blood. If there's anybody else, no matter how young you are and no matter how old you are, it is your time to get right with God. The goal isn't just to come and cry a tear. The goal is to break your will at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, not my will. From now on, my life belongs to you. I believe you are the Son of God. And I'm going to live my life for you. The rest of you, can I ask you to stretch your hands toward these people? Those of you here in the front, I want you to pray this with me out loud. Say, Lord Jesus Christ. Church, help them. Say, Lord Jesus Christ. I believe you are the Son of God who died on that cross for all of my sin. I admit I fell short of your glory. I repent of my sin, of how I grieved you and how I lived. Wash me with your blood. My heart, my conscience and my life. Cleanse me right now. I don't hide my sin. I lay it at your feet. I give you my life. I give you my heart in my future. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pledge to follow you, to serve you, and worship you only with everything in me. Help me Holy Spirit. Father in the name of Jesus I ask you that you will just right now seal. I ask you right now that you will accept this repentance. I ask you right now, God, that alabaster box will break. I ask you, God, right now that you will break the hearts of those that need to be broken as their knees are on the ground. I ask you in the name of Jesus, that the prodigals, that those maybe who have their faith did not click, let right now th that seed of your word come inside of their heart, God. Let the revival, let that breakthrough right now in their spiritual life happen. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus that the power of the cross, I ask you, Lord, that the power of the blood right now will wash, will wash what is what's wrong with us. I ask you that the power of the cross, Lord, we will experience freedom, freedom, God, freedom, Lord God, from the besetting sins, freedom from the things that were not pleasing to you that we habitually did, Lord. 
We forsake those sins. We forsake those habits. We forsake those patterns. We forsake those relationships and associations, God. We forsake that lifestyle that grieves your spirit, God. We lay it at the altar right now, Lord. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Jesus. Mercy on us, God. Son of David, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For those of you who lost that connection with the Holy Spirit and today you're realizing you've been like that young man, you've been running empty. Oh, you didn't run empty all your life. But it's been like that for a long time. That caution, that conviction, that sensitivity, that baby skin heart is gone. And even as I was talking, something just probed in your heart. And you literally felt like this, we described you. Whether you come to the front or kneel there, this is your moment with God. I want you to come to the Holy Spirit. Surrender to Him right now. The Holy Spirit is ready to fill you. The Holy Spirit is ready to change you. The presence of the Holy Spirit is thick in this room. His power is here. Not just to give you a tingling feeling, but to give you a shift, a change. But you have to respond. Come out of your seat, get in the aisle, get on your knees somewhere where you are at. It's between you and God. Not a man's gonna come and touch you right now, but Holy Spirit is gonna touch you right now. For the rest of you, I want you to close your eyes. Do not be distracted. It doesn't matter if you're a leader or a pastor. God doesn't look at titles right now. He's looking at children. He's looking at children. He's looking at empty hearts. And He's saying, come son, come daughter. I wanna fill you. I wanna renew you. I wanna replenish you. I want your focus to be on me, not on people. I want your focus to be on me, not on your circumstances. I want your focus to be on me and not on what people say about you. Come on, close your eyes. Just raise your hands. When you raise your hands, it's an act of surrender. But raise your heart to God because you can raise your hands without raising your heart. Those of you who are leaders, those of you who are leaders in your family, Raise those hands to God and say, Lord, I surrender to you. Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, I love you. Fill me right now. Renew me. I love you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Just press into the Lord. Let His presence draw you in. It's one thing when you press in. It's another thing when the Lord draws you in. His presence is here. Just let Him draw you in. For those of you that are burned out, for those of you that are tired, just lay that at His feet right now. The Holy Spirit can take care of it. Holy Spirit can take care of it. If you came with nightmares, torments, disease or sickness, just lay it at His feet. Just lay it at His feet. Somebody was just free from anxiety disorder. God just broke that off of you. Because you were worshiping, those chains are being broken. Those intrusive thoughts are being broken. Those nightmares are being broken. That confusion is leaving. The flood of God's peace is coming like a flood and washing that away right now. In His presence, there is fullness of joy. Depression has no room. Anxiety has no space heaviness has no permission intrusive thoughts doubt fear that has to go the heartbreak gets healed because in the presence of the Lord mountains melt like wax in his presence the hard hearts get melt broken pieces get restored wounds get healed Jesus your presence Jesus your glory, Jesus your precious anointing, the Holy Spirit's power flow right now in this room. Touch those that are in need, free those that are bound, liberate those that are chained. May the grip of pornography, may the grip of confusion will no longer be the portion. Any lust or immorality, 
Envy is so depressed with death or despair. In the name of Jesus, it has to loose its grip right now and be free in Jesus' name. And be free in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Holy Spirit. I want to take a moment right now and move toward praying for people who would love to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So for those of you here in the front, if I could ask for just a courtesy, if you can um, just step, just a step back. You can still stay in the front, but just take a step back. If you are a young person and you're hungry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to pray for you today. There's no pressure. You can develop intimacy with the Holy Spirit where you are at spiritually. But if you're hungry for that and today the Lord is touching and you say, I'm hungry and I'm ready to receive from God today. Just step forward. We would love to minister to you today and pray for you. You're not less a Christian. But if you're hungry, the Lord wants to touch you. In Jesus' name. Just, just step just step forward just come and those of you who are here uh, and you don't have that you can just step backwards just come no, 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 no need to clap let's go yeah for those of you who want to receive that just step forward one of the greatest things that could happen to you as a young person is your first encounter with the Holy Spirit I remember that I want you, those of you in the front, just look at me for just a moment. Just look at me for just a moment. So how many of you here, you want to receive the baptism of the Spirit? Raise your hand because I don't know who's... Okay. Okay, good. Good. Just look at me for just a second. I know how stressful meetings like this could be. When there's a lot of pressure. That happened to me. For six months, I, I couldn't get it. It happened to me at the balcony at Saturday, 2 p.m. of my parents' duplex. So, but what I want to give you instruction with is this. The Bible says, those who believe out of their belly will flow rivers of living water. I want you to notice, the Bible does not say that those rivers will come from heaven, but out of this belly, meaning not physical belly, out of your spirit, as a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you. You don't get the Holy Spirit when you speak in tongues. You get the Holy Spirit when you become a Christian. So the river is there. Think of this, a water connected to your house is already in the faucet. It's not coming out of the faucet until you open the faucet, but it's already there. So the water is there. You don't have to ask the city, bring the water. You just have to, the faucet has to be turned on. So when you pray, when you receive, you will feel, the Bible says, they spoke in tongues, book of Acts chapter 2 verse 4, as the Spirit gave the utterance. We don't make up things as we go, but we also understand that speaking in tongues, when God, the Bible says, open your mouth and I will fill it. How many of you know you can't drink water from a fountain with your mouth closed? You do have to open your mouth. And so it's both. It's God sovereignly touching you. And an act of faith, because everything in the kingdom of God is an act of faith. You're opening your mouth and you're allowing the river of the Holy Spirit to flow. But this is where the mind kicks in. And the mind, say, the mind says, you're crazy. Don't do that. No, that's not right. But the Bible says mind is unfruitful, meaning it's not completely disconnected. It just goes in the back seat because the Spirit prays. My friend one time shared a story of a father teaching his young daughter how to pray. So he taught her the Lord's Prayer. The next morning or the next evening, he's coming to her door to hear how she prays. And instead of praying the prayer he taught her, the Lord's Prayer, she's praying A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So he got a little bit just thrown off. He's thinking maybe it's just first one night. 
The second night, she's playing the ABCs again. The third night, he already had it enough. He comes to his daughter, he says, I taught you how to pray the Lord's Prayer. Why are, why are you praying the alphabet? She said, Daddy, I give God the letters and I trust Him to assemble it as He wants to. <laughs> See, when we pray in tongues, sometimes we don't know what we're praying. But we release what's there from the Holy Spirit. There is an act of faith that's involved. For those of you who think that God will just take over your tongue, God is a gentleman. He doesn't control. He fills. And He will work with us. And so, what we want to do today is I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. I want to allow without people praying for you, for the Lord to touch you. I know that God can do that and I know that you're hungry. If you're hungry, just allow Him. Don't be afraid. Oh, but what if it's going to be my tongues? Well, they will be coming out of your mouth. So to some degree, some of that will be yours. But it's not going to be from the devil. Jesus says, if you ask the Holy Spirit, God's not going to give you a snake. So we can rest assured it's going to come from God. Amen. I want you to close your eyes. Just stretch your hands to the Lord like this. We're going to pray a simple prayer because Jesus is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you're the baptizer with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I hunger, I thirst for more of your Holy Spirit. I desire that which you promised, that which disciples received. You said in your word that out of our belly, that out of our spirit, your rivers will flow. I yield to you. I trust in you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Baptize me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Father, fill them with the Holy Ghost right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Touch them right now, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus, the baptizer, with the Holy Spirit and fire. As on the day of Pentecost, I ask you that your fire will come right now. Baptize them with the Holy Ghost and fire right now. Touch them with the Holy Ghost and fire. I feel the Holy Spirit's presence is touching right now. Just whatever syllables come out of your spirit, just release them. Just release them. Let the river flow through your mouth, through the syllables. Don't filter them, just let it out. If it's just one syllable, just keep on praying that. Just keep on saying that to the Lord. Keep on saying that. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks right now. It's about you and God. Come on church, the rest of you, just pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Just pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Be filled with the Holy Spirit right now. Jesus. Father, I thank you for your presence. Father, I thank you for your spirit. If I can welcome the team now, the, the ministry team with the ministry tags, if you can just come in and just place your hand on the shoulder. Don't, don't yell in their ear, but just pray for them for just a minute or a minute and a half. If you have a, a simple instruction, don't put any pressure, uh, but just come and just pray with them. Let's just agree. And those of you who are here, you just focus on the Lord. Don't, it's not about who's praying for you. It's Jesus that is giving that. Amen. And the rest of you, would you stretch your hands forward? We're just going to pray for about a minute and a half. Just, just pray with them right now. Agree with them. Some of you, these are young children. Let the Lord touch them. Let His presence mark their life right now. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank You that You are the one who promised the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus we thank you that you are the one that baptizes in the Holy Spirit and I ask you right now that you will mark every teenager mark every young man and every young adult with the presence of the Holy Spirit and with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask you that out of their belly will flow the rivers of living water. But most importantly, that the Holy Spirit will become their friend. That the Holy Spirit will become their helper. That they will know, host the Holy Spirit in their life. I ask you most importantly, that the Holy Spirit will become real to them right now. That there will be a revelation. That there will be a revelation of who the Holy Spirit is in their life right now. Holy Spirit, that your embrace, that your love, that right now your, your warmth will overwhelm them, will overshadow them like you overshadowed Mary. Overshadow them right now. May your fire come. May your wind come. May your river flow right now in their life in the name of Jesus. Father, we surrender our life to you. We commit to know the Holy Spirit. We commit to pursue the Holy Spirit. We commit to live our life pleasing to the Holy Spirit. We commit to live our life full of the Holy Spirit, full of Your Word, full of purity, full of the ways that honor the Holy Spirit. To live our life without leaking, but live our life overflowing the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask You for every young man and every young woman at this altar, I ask you that your fire on the altar in their heart will not die out. I pray that it will burn for you. I pray that it will burn for you, Jesus. I pray that you will set them on fire as they give themselves to you, Lord, that their life will become a tithe, that their life will become an offering, that their life will go on the altar for your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, King of Kings. I worship you, Lord of Lords. We honor you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Before I turn the microphone over, I want to just pray right now a prayer for those people who are here and you specifically maybe came and you experienced illness in your body. I know that we already have people at the altar. Those of you watching us online, I want to pray for that. A lady came to our church, um, had a leukemia, got saved that Sunday. And uh, the Lord um, gave me a word of knowledge that somebody's being healed of um, a blood, blood problem. So she came up right away on the stage and said, hey, I had leukemia and I feel like I'm healed. You know, and those testimonies, they're a lot of emotion is involved in that so we said you need to go back to the doctor and your doctor has to confirm it so she goes back to the doctor they do an MX examination the doctor calls her right after that and he says you need to come very quickly to my office and so she she really got freaked out she thought that this has just got really really bad so she goes to the doctor and the doctor the reason why he called her in and invited other doctors is brought her um, the medical report of her blood levels and said this, I haven't seen this happen before, but you literally a miracle. We have to test you again. I tested her again and they found no trace of blood cancer in her blood. A young lady was watching a video on YouTube had lupus and medically verified lupus. And she received prayer. It was just a simple prayer, but distance is not a barrier goes back to her doctor and then sent us a medical report and with the medical report showing before and after the prayer where there was no trace of lupus in her body and God supernaturally healed her and medical science verified it. You know, we couldn't have kids for 13 years. I have faith in my heart. Do I see everyone getting healed? No. But I still believe in God who heals. I still believe in God who delivers. And I still believe in the God who hears prayer. Right there where you are at. Maybe you've been believing for this for a long time. I want to add to your faith in this prayer. That the Lord will meet you at the point of your need. The Bible says they will lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. 
just right there where you are at, just place your hand on the part of the body where there is pain. If you have illness, um, a sickness, or something you're battling with, let's fight together in prayer. Let's believe. Lord Jesus, I ask you right now by your mercy that you will have mercy and compassion. Son of David, have mercy on us. As you did with blind Bartimaeus, we agree right now with every person from minor to major things. In Jesus' name, we pray right now for those problems that are with muscles, those problems that are with bones, those problems that are with lower back, upper back, we pray for those problems with breathing. In the name of Jesus, let your healing touch come right now. Lord Jesus, I ask you for those problems that exist in the digestive system, that they will be healed right now. That your healing virtue will come. In the name of Jesus, I come in agreement with every couple that believes for children. That you will begin to bring openness as you did for Hannah. That you will do it for them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I come in agreement right now for anybody that's battling with cysts, growth, or all kinds of cancerous cells. Whether they're fighting with it with all kinds of medication, Lord God, or just believing by faith. Lord, I agree with them right now for their faith to be made strong and for you to meet them at the point of their need. Jesus, I thank you that by your stripes we were healed. I thank you for your mercy and your compassion today. I pray for that student who got injured in the gym for that person that got injured in a motor accident. Lord, that you will begin to bring healing and restoration and bring mobility to their body. In the name of Jesus, we speak healing to every ear infection right now. We speak healing to every nearsightedness or any blindness in the name of Jesus. Joints receive strength right now in the name of Jesus. Arthritis, we just command it to go and leave in the name of Jesus Christ. Eczema, skin infection, rashes. Lord, heal your people right now. Lord, we declare our body is not for sickness, our body is for service. Our body is your temple. We want to live for you with our body. And right now as we lift our hands to you, Lord, we give that pain. We give our struggle to you. We receive your grace. We receive your mercy. We thank you, Jesus. You are our Rapha. You are our Jehovah. You are our healer. We trust in you, Lord, that you are restoring us. You are renewing us and we will live for you. Come on, lift those hands right now. Just begin to honor Him. Let's begin to praise Him right now. Let's begin to say, Lord, I worship You. Lord, I honor You. Lord, You are my Savior. You are my Deliverer. You are my Prince of Peace. Lord, You are my Healer. Lord, You are my Restorer. Lord, You are my Yahweh. Lord, You are my Healer. You are my Rapha. Jesus, I declare Your name. Jesus, I declare Your Word. Jesus, I declare your goodness. Jesus, I declare your name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Jesus, hallelujah to your name. Declare His name, Yahweh. Yahweh, We thank you, Lord. We thank you that your name is power. We thank you that your name is salvation. Your name is healing. Your name is peace. Your name calms the storms. Your name restores, renews, and revives. We love you, Jesus. Demons.
tremble at the sound of your name, Lord. We are called by your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just receive that prayer today. For those of you who had an illness and maybe you couldn't do something without that pain, you can test your body, examine it. And if you notice that you, that pain is gone, just glorify Jesus. Tell somebody that Jesus touched you and Jesus healed you because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever the same. Amen. And for every teenager, every high schooler, I want to challenge you that this coming season of your life, you will dedicate to the Lord. You will give that tithe to the Lord. In fact, I want to ask if you are a teenager to raise your hand. If you have a hand raised next to you, I want you to place your hand on their shoulder. Not on their head, just on their shoulder. But if you're a teenager, just keep your hand up. We're going to pray right now for this teenage generation. We're going to specifically pray that their years will be given to the Lord. If your hand is raised, I'm believing that you're going to pray a prayer right now. Lord, I'm giving you my teenage years. Come on. Keep your hand up as a teenager. And I want you to begin to surrender your teenage years to God. The body of Jesus, some of your friends, some of your colleagues are praying with you right now that these teenage years are not for sexual immorality. These teenage years are not so you become pro at video games or social media influencer, but that you become the salt and light, that you become a man and woman of God, that you become a person that lays your life on the altar, that you become a person that is living for Jesus Christ. These years are not for you. These are years for Jesus. These are years for the Holy Spirit. These are the years that you will invest into the kingdom of God. You will serve at your local church. You will go to Bible school. You will go to some kind of a, or some kind of a thing that will help you to build your life for Jesus. We agree right now, Lord, with every teenager that is, has his hand and has her hand raised that you will mark them. May this coming next 12 months, may it be God a time where they will live for you. May it be a time God where you will protect them from demonic distractions. You will protect them from all kinds of demonic attractions. The God that you will begin to abuse them, set them on fire in their school, set them on fire in their church, set them on fire in their home. God, let them begin to pray, organize prayer meetings. Let them begin to organize meetings for their friends to know Jesus. Let them begin to gather to read the Bible in their lunch hour. Father, give them creative ideas. Let revival break out in their youth group. Let revival break out in their home. Let revival break out in their cafeteria. Let revival break out in their middle school and their high school. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, release special grace that as they go home, they will start fires for your kingdom. Friends will be converted to Christ. People will be delivered and people will be saved. And that these young men and young women will be like Samuel, they will hear the voice of God. Like Jesus at 12 years of age, he already talked to the Pharisees and to the leaders and the law, the teachers of the law. And these young men, Lord God and young women are going to be your catalyst in this generation. In Jesus' name. And devil, they don't belong to you. Me and my house will serve God. In the name of Jesus, we make a declaration. Our generation, devil is not going to serve your agenda. Our teenagers, they will not help to propagate your darkness. They will serve Jesus. They will follow the Lamb where the Lamb goes. And they will live for Jesus. And devil, there's nothing you can do to stop it because of the Holy Ghost, because of Jesus. Lord, I declare your blessing over them. Lord, I declare your commissioning over them that they will go like salt at the source in their school. Father, I ask you that you will give them words and boldness to stand up against the demonic agenda, to preach the good news with love and truth and to be the light and salt. I pray their house, their basements and attics will become Bible studies and prayer meetings. In Jesus' name. As the boy that gave five loaves and two fish, 
Lord, when those teenagers raised their hands, this was their loaves and fish. Multiply them, Lord. As you did it with me, multiply it in their life. May there be a shift after this conference. Something shifts in their walk. Something shifts in their life, in their school for your kingdom. And those who go to Christian schools, I pray that you will light them on fire because so many students in Christian schools have demons and they don't know Jesus. Use our students to bring the good news of Jesus even to the Christian schools in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Lord. Amen.